and my and one of my parents would uh, drop me off and uh, I would hitchhike home. My <laughs> wife does not believe that I hitchhike home every day, but a bunch of us would go on a corner of Seneca Parkway and Dewey, stick our thumbs out, and people would pick us up and take us. At that time, there was a traffic circle. There used to be a traffic circle on the other end of uh, the Memorial Bridge. And because my parents moved from the city to Aronico and I went to Aquinas. And uh, we would hitchhike to the traffic circle and then people would pick us up from the traffic circle going north <laughs> every day. Oh. And um, the, uh, the thing that, uh, th the difference in driving into Aquinas today and driving into Aquinas in 1964 is that Aquinas looks like a small college. Mm -hmm. It really does. It did not have that look in 1964. Also, there were no girls in 1964. And um, when uh, my sons, I have four sons, and when they started coming to Aquinas, uh, they played sports. And I remember going to a soccer game uh, and um, watching the game, uh, the first game, the home game, <coughs> and uh, all of a sudden I heard a bunch of uh, female voices cheering them on. And I looked over, and there was the Aquinas girls' soccer team. They just came from a practice, and they were standing there with their old uniforms, mud. A couple of them had blood on their face. <laughs> and I thought, oh, my God, this is different than the Nazareth girls. <laughs> with their hair all nice and their makeup on, and cheering Aquinas. So um, things have changed. But I, want, I brought some paper so I can remember what I did in life here. <laughs> Uh, but um, there's a couple of things that <coughs> I wanted to start off to tell you that uh, I noticed Mike Daly's got the um, Irish, uh, the shamrock, the maroon shamrock on his lapel. And you all know this, and I want to tell you, because you're going to be graduating, there's a really deep tradition here. It's, it's a community. If you stay in Rochester, especially, the... Uh, I can't tell you how many times I had pre-trial conferences or uh, lawyers appeared in front of me in court and I looked down and I saw the shamrock on the hotel. So they must have Googled. They would wear that shamrock all the time. Um, I've had uh, uh, people come in to, and you know, they would introduce themselves and then they would all, there would always be a tag. They would say, I went to Quiet, I graduated in, you know, uh, 78 or 90 or something like that, you know, and so I would get that. The shocker I had is one time I had a murder case and the public defender said there was a conflict. And um, so we call the signed counsel office and the, uh, <coughs> they send an attorney over that has had experience, felony trial experience. And the, uh, a woman attorney walked in and there was a pause and she told me when she graduated from a <laughs> So I went, whoa. <laughs> I'm getting old. That was the first woman attorney that appeared in front of me that went to Aquinas. Um, a, a humorous Aquinas story is uh, I had a trial, and uh, uh, my uh, I think it was uh, when uh, Joe and Chris were on the uh, varsity soccer team, and one of your teachers there, Jeff Page, was also on the uh, on the team, and uh, um, he they had a game and. They came back to the bench, and his warm-up uh, jersey was gone from the bench. So nobody knew what happened to it. So we're ready to start the trial. I walk in, but all rise. I sit down, and I look, and the defendant is wearing an Aquinas soccer warm-up jersey. <laughs> <laughs> so when we took a, uh, took a uh, recess in the morning, I called the, the lawyer up in the DA, and I said, look at um, your uh, client's got an Aquinas soccer warm-up jersey on with the number 13. 17. 17. Yeah. That's right, 17. Yeah. With the number 17 on it. Uh, it's not his jersey. <laughs> uh, when you leave court, put, make sure that the jersey's on the table and we'll forget about it. <laughs> and so, sure enough, at the end of the day, I looked out of the jersey. <laughs> so Jeff got his jersey back. That's a, a good Aquinas community story. Uh, when Jay called and uh, said that he would like me to speak, he said he wanted me to uh, talk to you about what I've done and uh, how some of the things I've done may help you in your networking and in your lives. Um, 
I, uh, like I said, I'm a Aquinas boy. I went to Niagara University. Uh, I was an English major. I wanted to uh, be an English teacher. That was my uh, thing. Um, when I was a senior, I lived in a house with 14 guys. And uh, I used to play in a band. And <coughs> so I played in the band first, and I went to school second, which was not a good idea. Because <laughs> my study habits were not real, real uh, home. Uh, but anyway, one of the guys in the house was real gung-ho, wanted to go to law school. So I listened to him, and I kind of was interested, you know, uh, in it. And uh, so I uh, applied to take the uh, LSAT. Now, the LSAT was on a Saturday in Buffalo. We played, band played at Canisius College the night before uh, uh, we uh, opened for the box tops. I don't know if you remember that song, Give Me a Ticket for an Airplane. That was there. And uh, we opened for them. And I didn't get back to Niagara until like 2 or 3 in the morning. So, and I had to be at uh, the test at 9 in Buffalo the next morning. I should have stayed in Buffalo, but I went back. And I'm laying in bed, and I almost didn't get up. So that's how close I came to not to being a lawyer. And um, so I took the LSAT. I was always good at those quickie exams. My marks weren't the best. I mean, I wasn't a bad student, but I was a little bit above average. And uh, so I applied, and uh, I'm positive one of the priests at Niagara, they are Vincentian fathers. One of the priests came from St. John's. He just came up from St. John's University because they're Vincentian fathers. And he helped a couple of us get it to uh, uh, St. John's. So that was great. So I went to New York. I figured, hey, this is great. I'm going down to the big city. I play the guitar down there. <laughs> <laughs> what was I in for a rude awakening? Uh, I lived with three other guys, and they studied. And that's how, that's how I got to it. Um, I met my wife my second year. She's from England. She was a, uh, a nanny on Long Island for a while. And she was on her way back, but she stayed. And uh, she thought that all of New York State was like New York City. <laughs> and so I brought her up here, and she really liked it. And uh, so we settled in Rochester. Um, my first uh, job, I had to hit the pavement uh, and, and apply. I went to different law firms because I never, a lot of lawyers, uh, they're, uh, uh, in law school, their second year, they get a job with a law firm because they're, they're focused. I was not focused, I'll tell you the truth. Um, also, that uh, if you recall, I, I went to law school in 68, 69, 70, the Tet Offensive, Vietnam. We all got drafted. We all got drafted at that time, but they, get, they let you finish law school. And I went in the Army, I was at Fort Benning, so I was delayed a little at, uh, at uh, finding a job or getting into a firm. So um, I was very fortunate because I interviewed, the, the, it was a small firm, and it was called Palmieri, Passero, and Crimi. And uh, they were, if not the best, one of the best criminal law firms in town. I was not interested in criminal law, and uh, but they really got, they, they <laughs> made me work hard. I learned a lot. I went to trials. I wrote some uh, stuff down. The, uh, for, to help you possibly in private, when I was in private practice, you've got to watch and you've got to learn. No matter what business you're in, that's what you got to do. No matter how old you are, you still have to watch and learn. And that's what I did. Charlie Crimi, uh, the older one, now there's a judge, Charlie Crimi, in city court. That's his son. But the older one was my first boss. He was an excellent, excellent criminal lawyer. He was in the United States Attorney's Office in Buffalo. And I remember when I walked into his office for the first time, I looked up, and his appointment papers were on the wall signed Robert Kennedy. So Kennedy was the one that uh, appointed him. And uh, he was very well revered. Um, he did a lot of work for the poor, so they have a Charlie Crimi Award every year they give out. I remember walking into the office on a Monday morning, there would be a basket of tomatoes outside of his uh, door, and that was payment for one of his clients who did that city so the table. But all three of them uh, were good teachers. Uh, they persuaded me to join the Bar Association. And that's one of the things I want to tell you. That, that it, it's good to join associations. I know sometimes it's a pain. Uh, I know many of you are involved in uh, different associations to do with your work. But you've got to branch out. Um, branch out. I branched out. I got admitted to federal courts, state courts. And um, 
they got me involved in, uh, not in politics per se, but involved in going to different functions where there was politics involved. And I never knew too much about politics. I was not even, I was a registered blank as they called it, you know. Uh, and uh, so I got to meet more people because of that. So if you are interested in it, uh, you know, get involved. They also got me involved with the uh, police. Uh, even though they were defense attorneys, they were well respected with the police. Um, Norman Palmieri uh, was in the DA's office in, in Rochester, and he was very well respected, and, and uh, half of his clients were police officers, you know, <laughs> a, 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 in civil matters. So I, I met quite a few of the police. Uh, I had my first trial, uh, I uh, was uh, assigned to represent a kid that was charged with stealing drywall from the school. And uh, the thing I remember about it is that the, uh, the witness was the caretaker and he was describing things that he heard uh, and uh, so that he knew that something was being taken and, uh, and his examination was peripheral, but it was important. But I noticed that when the district attorney was asking him questions, the district attorney was right up on him talking to him like this and talking somewhat loud. So I got up when it was time for cross-examination and I faced the jury and asked them a question softly mm -hmm. and he didn't answer. So I asked him again a little louder and he didn't answer. So the judge was not a friend of me, I guess, so he <laughs> says, okay, Perry Mason, you got your point across. <laughs> you know, I remember that. And so the, the uh, guy was found not guilty and I can make, I thought I was Perry Mason, you know, my <laughs> first trial, I was not guilty. And um, so the guys set me down and said, okay, look at Joe, uh, uh, we like your enthusiasm, but the people who come to the firm are coming for us, they're not coming for you. Um, but they convinced me uh, to go into the uh, either the DA's office or public defender's office because then you get a baptism by fire. They throw, because I love the court room. I got, I got stuck. As soon as I went in there and started trying a case, that was it for me. So um, uh, they said, you know, you go in for like three years or so, and then uh, uh, come out and you can come back to the firm and be more experienced, and it'll be great for you. And uh, they they pushed me to go into the DA's office because they had been in the DA's office because for two things, one is that um, you present to grand juries. Now, grand juries, uh, I don't know if you know much about it, or if any of you have ever served on a grand jury, but it's not like a regular jury. They sit and they listen to cases, and uh, they decide whether or not to indict uh, somebody or not. And recently in the news, you're hearing a lot about grand juries. But um, the DA is the allowed in the grand jury to present the case, and then the DA has to leave. Nobody can be in the grand jury when they decide whether or not to indict somebody. But there's not, it's not uh, a trial type of situation. The DA puts in the bare minimum to show that they have a case, and then the grand jury votes. They said that when you, if you do this, you'll get to uh, see what juries want. And they were correct, because grand jury, there's a time in the grand jury when you present your case, and then the grand jurors ask questions. So they say, what about this? Or how about this? And some are not proper, so you tell them. But you get a feel for what a jury is looking for in various cases. And it's tremendously helpful when you start trying your own cases as a DA. And they said, so you get to go in the grand jury in a second, you get to know how the cops think and what the cops do. If you're in the DA's office, you'll know the good cops, the bad cops, you know if the investigation is good, you'll know the evidence and, and all that. So I applied for the DA's office. At the time, Nixon was the president. And he, and he poured money into law enforcement. I know that Trump is yelling and screaming how he pours money into law enforcement. Nobody poured money into law enforcement like Nixon did. So it, there was a thing called the LEAA, uh, and I forgot what the initials stood for, but uh, in any event, the Monroe County DA's office got money for nine assistant DAs all at once, boom, just like that. And uh, so I was one of the nine. I got, that, I got accepted there. My office at Palmieri Pastor and Crimi was in the library, and uh, my office in the DA's office, my first office was in the library, <laughs> same place. So um, another thing, my famous two words, watch and learn. That's important, because that's what I did there. I watched the, the good DA's, 
uh, try their cases. I got out into the community. Um, I was the DA, DA uh, liaison to the uh, Rochester Police Force. Um, I worked my way up. What had happened was uh, there was an election, uh, and the DA that hired me lost. So the new DA, DA came in. When the new DAs come in, they lop off the top people because they want their own people there as first assistant, second assistant, chief trial assistant. So the top guys got lopped off. We're on the bottom, so we moved up. Uh, Tom, Tom Van Strider, uh, who uh, became a judge eventually with me in Supreme Court and is now working for uh, uh, Cheryl Donolfo, uh, he and I were partners. They used to partner you up back then. And he would take, and we were assigned to a judge. He would try a case. I would prepare. Uh, I tried a case he would prepare, so we would tandem it like this. He was my partner for years, so he and I we went. Whoosh, we got uh, promoted quick, um, and the new DA took a liking to both of us. Uh, I went into the uh, Special Investigations Bureau, where I did a lot of grand jury work with Don Wisner, who be also became a judge, um, and then I was. Um, made the Bureau Chief of the Career Criminal Bureau. I don't think you've ever heard of it, but it was a great innovation in law enforcement. What they did is that uh, the police would have a chart, and if they arrested somebody, they would add points if the guy had a prior record, if it was a violent crime, if he was known to be violent, uh, what was stolen, what was taken, and what were the injuries, all these things, the neighborhoods, the whole thing. And if the points added up to a certain number, they would notify us, one of us from Career Criminal Bureau would go down to arraignments in city court, and we'd, uh, we would uh, be the DA on arraignment, give the defendant notice that the case was going in the grand jury within 24 hours. Now that's unbelievable now, because cases don't go to grand jury for like 90 days sometimes. And so it was expedited. We put these cases in the grand jury fast, then we would get a preference for trial. Now the public defender uh, attacked that. They brought us to the appellate division saying we can't do that, and we won. So we got the trial preference, and we got the guy into trial within 60 days of his arrest, and they had a 98% conviction record because most of them pled guilty at the time. And I'm not kidding, the burglary rate in Rochester went down after about a year. It really did because we were hitting the guys that were doing all the burglaries, you know, the burglary rates. And, um, and it wasn't just property crimes. It went all the way up to murder or, or, or whatever. But most of your murders are not uh, career criminals. Most of the murders are you know, money, sex, that kind of thing. They're not, these guys just go out there to, to commit crimes all the time. So in any event, uh, I was a bureau chief of career criminal. And then I was made the head of all the uh, major crimes. Um, uh, uh, and then. Uh, what I did is that I took cases, this is what I want to tell you about um, your, your own profession. When I started, I took cases that a lot of the other ones wouldn't take. Uh, you probably don't remember this, but the Barge Canal broke out in Pittsburgh back in the 70s. And the water flooded into Pittsburgh and a couple mm -hmm. people almost got killed. Millions of dollars of damage. And they found that the um, engineer, what they had done is the county decided to build a uh, tunnel under the canal out there, and they found that the engineer that they had hired uh, to give them a report had indicated that it wasn't a good time to build it, and they completely disregarded the report, and the canal broke. Mm -hmm. And so they asked the district attorney to investigate to see if there was criminal liability. And everybody went, shoot. <laughs> so the DA came to me and he asked if I would consider it. And I said, oh boy. So I said, okay. I did. And I spent uh, a week in the mud out there. <laughs> and uh, we put the ca it was a long, drawn out process. And a guy did get indicted from um, the county. Uh, it, it, uh, Nothing really happened. I mean, he didn't go to jail or anything like that. But he got indicted, and, and uh, so I took that case. But all of a sudden, my picture was in the paper because they got me <laughs> go walking into the grand jury with the engineer that gave the report, and it was like, you know, who is this guy? Because I was not that uh, uh, 
due to the DA's office. I was still new. So I took that and that out. And then I took cases where, like one case, this guy, the only thing that the victim identified him with was from his teeth. Um, I took that case and nobody wanted that case. And, and then, that, and, and so you get better and better. And so then I started getting high profile cases. I got the ca uh, murder cases. Uh, the, the, this poor kid that was killed by the motorcycle gang and they threw him in the canal. And that was a big case because his family was a prominent family in the community. Uh, and then I had the case of Sister Maureen Murphy. Some of you may remember that, but a nun was uh, charged with killing her baby in the convent, uh, Lady of Lords Convent in Brighton. And uh, I remember uh, Larry Curlander was the DA, and it was like around 6 o'clock in the morning, and the phone rings. And he goes, Joe, uh, are you awake? I go, well, I am now. <laughs> <laughs> are you sitting down? I go, why? What's going on? He says, well, uh, I know you're not on call, but I'd like you to go out to uh, Lady of Lords Convent this morning because there's a homicide. I go, oh, my God, a nun, a nun was killed? He goes, uh, not really. He mm -hmm. said, uh, he said, I'll tell you more about it when you get out here. I said, okay. So I get dressed. I start to go. My wife yells, oh, where are you going? I said, oh, I got a, a case thing. I got to go. She goes, well, what's it about? I said, are you sitting down? <laughs> 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 I get out there, and uh, it began a long process. And um, it was a very interesting case because I had to learn uh, a lot. I had to learn about postpartum psychoses. Uh, the, uh, my wife was expecting our third child, so I kept reading everything that could go wrong with the pregnancy. <laughs> oh and uh, Dr. Ruth Schwartz, who was a famous doctor at Strong, she helped me out. She, I, I still have the book she gave me on the pregnancy. Um, one interesting thing in that case is that the uh, uh, we believe that the nun bit the umbilical cord because mm. she, she gave birth to the baby in the room uh, with nobody around. And that's how she um, uh, separated the baby from her. And uh, to, to strengthen that, we brought in a doctor from, um, had, that had done work in Africa. And what he had indicated is that's quite common in Africa where in some of the villages where they don't have medical help right away, they will do that and then they will take the baby in and then the doctors will have to help them out. Um, I gave notice to the defense that I was using them, but they, they kind of passed off on him, and I, I didn't really explain why I was using him, just that he was a, an expert witness on uh, the birth. And uh, my old boss was a defensive, so it was interesting. And uh, that irony did not pass me by. Um, so now Charlie's cross-examining the guy, and then he, he gave him the question. And, and, and we always tell lawyers, never ask the question unless you know the answer. You know, he made a big mistake. And he said uh, he wanted to know how he knew about all these things, you know, about the women and, uh, and the umbilical cords. And so the guy laid into him about the uh, being in Africa, and the judge let him go on and on and on, and his credibility got bigger and bigger <laughs> and bigger. And Charlie turned and looked at me and gave me a little wink like that. He said, you got me. You got me. But the it was a non-jury case. The judge found her not guilty. Quite often I get questions like whatever happened to her, I honestly don't know. Uh, about five years after the trial, Channel 10 cameraman came to me and says, Hey, I saw the nun in Cape Cod. I go, yeah, right. He goes, no, he says, I saw her. She was walking across. I was stopping at a, a stop sign, and she was walking across the street. And I said, how do you know it was her? He goes, listen, she was in my lens for three weeks. <laughs> I said, I knew it was her. But that's the last I heard. They, um, a woman made $800,000 uh, writing a book about it. It's called Unholy Child. But she had to write it as a fiction because she was found not guilty. But it was interesting because it's the whole story. The whole story is in there. She copied my summation word for word from the transcript. Wow. Yeah. And, the, uh, and then uh, there was a movie made that very loosely is uh, based on it, Agnes of God with Jane Fonda. Back then, I always said that Robert Redford should have played me. <laughs> <laughs> but while I was in the DA's office, I, I got approached by a couple of attorneys, and they and they uh, said to me that maybe I should uh, run for office. And um, I I was a virgin. I had no clue, you know. And uh, so my uh, political my beginning political career was a bit of a kamikaze career, but. Um, 
it was, uh, I ran for Rochester City Court, I eventually won, and uh, I became a Rochester City Court judge. Um, my first day in the city court, I was very nervous. I, you know, they go, okay, let's go. So I went out, and they go, all rise, and Joe knows it, how the whole courtroom, everybody gets up, and part one is the arraignment part, and it was packed, and all of a sudden, you know, the Honorable Joseph D. Valentino presided, I go, <laughs> that's me. <laughs> so I sat down, and uh, Danny Mastrella, who was also an Aquinas graduate, was the DA. And he had worked for me in the DA's office, so it was funny. And he got up there, and, uh, and I said, okay, Mr. Mastrella, call the first case. So he calls the case, and I, I had the information, so I said, uh, you are um, so-and-so. And he goes, yeah. And I said, uh, Okay, uh, Mr. Mastrella, you're charged with robbery. <laughs> <laughs> and I read all the crimes and I said, and how do you plead? So Danny looks up to me and goes, Judge, I plead not guilty. <laughs> but you might want to ask him. <laughs> so that was my first day on the job there. Um, I had a lot of interesting cases. Uh, I, I had nuns again. I had the nuns that uh, protested out in the Social Security uh, place out there about welfare checks. And uh, I ruled that they should get an all-city jury because the thing happened in the city. And the reason I ruled for that was if you get arrested in Arondequoit or Brighton or Spencerport, you get an all-Arondequoit jur jur mm -hmm. jury or Brighton, all, or, uh, Brighton jury. If you get arrested in the city of Rochester, you get jurors from the jury pool that's in there. So you, you can get jurors from Hilton, uh, Pittsburgh, and some of these people, you won't believe this, some of these people have never been in Rochester. Yeah. Some people, you know, you start mentioning Rochester City streets, and they look at you like they're in Mars. <laughs> you know, so, um, uh, the, uh, and I'll tell you this, after ordering that, and I walked out, and you know how you, when you get on jury duty, you're sitting in the courtroom, and, uh, and you're waiting, and I walked out, and I looked at the prospective jurors, and there were 100 prospective jurors, and I looked out there, and it was the most diverse jury I had seen as a judge. It really was. And, uh, and I felt good about that. And to this day, if you want an all-city jury, you can get one. Not too many lawyers ask for one, but you can get one if you ask for one as an attorney. Um, uh, sh shortly, within the first couple months in city court, uh, they have prostitution raids. I don't know if they do anymore, but they would raid, but they would... Uh, uh, the cops would go out and, uh, and rape and bring in the prostitutes, you know, Lyle Avenue, Main Street, and all there. And then about a week later, they would have a John rape, the guys that patronized the prostitutes. Now, I noticed that the prostitutes, under the city law, the prostitutes had to have a physical. And back then, no one talked about AIDS. This was back in the 80s, early 80s. So they had to have a physical for uh, venereal disease, things like that. And, uh, uh, the men didn't have to have a physical. So I questioned that, and I looked, there was no provision. So I ordered the men to have a physical. Later that day, I got visited by everybody, lawyers, judges, like, you can't do that. You can't do that. I said, well, why? And I said, well, because it's not the law. You, uh, well, I said, they take me up. That's what the, the appellate courts are for. You know, take me to county court. But I think it's only fair. Women just don't get the diseases, you know. I mean, the men get them too. So um, I ordered that, and uh, and uh, and the one lawyer, lawyer for one of the guys was sputtering and stammering. And said, I'm gonna, I'm going to go to the press. I go, great idea. <laughs> your your client's picture is going to be on the front page. <laughs> Patronizing a prostitute if you want to go to the press. So he never went. But um, so to this day. And when they have raids, they order uh, uh, physicals for both the women and the men. They still do it. That, that, that stays in there. So I'm proud of that, and especially now with AIDS. <coughs> um, when you run for election, you cannot say what you would do as a judge. Like another, uh, and everybody asks you, what do you think about the death penalty? Uh, what do you think about abortion? You know, and you can't say, well, I, I can't comment on that because someday I might have it. And I've had both in front of me. Basically, even though the death penalty is not here, I've had death penalty cases, class A1 felonies. So um, you can't, uh, you're not supposed to comment on it. <coughs> and it, it, bear, it rang true because uh, about a year into being a judge, 
Remember, the protesters used to protest mostly at Genesee Hospital, the abortion protest. And they would go out and they'd protest in front of the doors. And, uh, and the, if they didn't uh, disperse after a while and uh, they were rowdy, the police would arrest them for disorderly conduct. So they, uh, one day the guy said, hey, you got a bunch of abortion protesters. And I said, okay, so I said, bring them out. You know, so they come out and about the third one came out. I looked, and it looked like he had a halo on his head from the, the uh, neon lights in the courtroom. And I'm looking, and the guy comes out there and looking closely, and looked closely, and I looked down at the information, and what he had done is he didn't want to leave, so he glued his head to the glass door of Genesee Hospital. So the police didn't know what to do, so they cut a cut the, a circle in the door, pulled him out, <laughs> and brought him down for a rainbow. And it looked like he had a halo. On it. He was no angel. <laughs> now the most famous city court story from me involves an Aquinas graduate, Eddie Calvaruso, who also became a judge. He was a lawyer at the time, and another friend of ours, uh, Chuck Nosey, <coughs> another lawyer. But uh, I was doing arraignments, and they arrested a guy for uh, uh, various crimes. The included was assault on a police officer. <coughs> and assault on a police officer is assault second degree, the felony. But a lot of times, when they're trying to arrest somebody and they resist, the guy might pull away and the cop might spring his hand or something. Quite often, we'll see like a bandage on a policeman's hand in the picture, and then the guy's head is wrapped in bandages and, and blood over here and everything. So you know what happened. <coughs> in any event, uh, uh, this guy comes out, and he was irate, and he goes, before you say anything, I want to know what they say I did. I said, okay, calm down. I said, that's what you're here for. I'm going to tell you what. They charge you with um, assault second degree on a police officer, resisting arrest. I'm going down. And then I hit disorderly conduct, which is only a violation. It's not a crime. The most you can get is 15 days in jail, and uh, it's being disorderly. <coughs> as soon as I said disorderly conduct, he went off. Disorderly conduct? I was not disorderly. I didn't do anything. Tell me what it says I did. He said, well, your attorney will get the information. He'll explain to you what uh, the allegations are. He goes, no, I want you to tell me. You tell me. And he's going on. Now I look down and I see that <coughs> Ed Calvaruso and Charlie Nosey are having a great time there. <laughs> my consternation up there. And they, they're trying not to laugh. And they see it. And I said, okay, look, I'll, I'll take a look. So I look at it and I go, oh, boy. So I said, he said, read it to me. Tell me what they said. <coughs> and he said, well, they said that you called the police officer a Catholic Dago bastard. <laughs> so now I hear him from the front row, he's got the wrong judge on all three. <laughs> <laughs> and so that story went around the Hall of Justice in about five minutes. <laughs> um, so city court, I was the supervising uh, judge of city court for uh, about nine years. And then I was appointed an acting county court judge to do the uh, drug treatment court. Uh, that is a great innovation in criminal justice. It's uh, well, uh, how long do I have here? Uh, how long do you want me to go, Jay? Yeah, it's about nine. Okay, good. <laughs> so um, what happens there is that uh, we didn't take any dealers. It's only users, and uh, they have to sign a contract that uh, no drugs or alcohol for a year. Uh, they have to get a high school degree or a GED, and they have to have a job. And we have the Department of Labor that helped them uh, get jobs when they were sober. If they do all three, uh, they don't go to jail or prison. Uh, and um, if uh, they, they fail in any of those three, they go to jail or prison. There's no probation, no community service. You either do it or go to jail. <coughs> it's a very successful program. Um, we were, New, uh, Rochester was the first drug court in New York State, uh, and now there's 3,000 drug courts uh, in the United States of America. I mean, it, they're really uh, successful. I mean, a lot of, lot of uh, success stories, <coughs> and I don't want to bore you with a million of them, but there are good success stories out of the drug court. Um, the, uh, the Democratic Party asked me to run for a Supreme Court <coughs> while I was a drug court judge, and I said no, uh, because first of all, at, th at that time, it took 
over $100,000 to run for Supreme Court. And I, I didn't have the money, and I hated asking people for money. And the uh, other thing is you can't win as a Democrat in the 7th Judicial District. The 7th Judicial District, when you run for Supreme Court, you run for Supreme Court judge for the whole state of New York. So once you win, they can send you anywhere in New York State. <coughs> But um, when you run, you run in your district, and we have an eight-county district. It goes from, uh, you know, us here and uh, going to Lake Ontario all the way down to the Pennsylvania border, and uh, between Buffalo and Syracuse, those eight counties. And it's a highly Republican district, so very few Democrats can win. So I can't win. Why should I take all that effort? But uh, we had a, a meeting. But with my sons and my wife and, uh, and friends and everybody, and um, uh, they convinced me uh, to take a chance. My wife wouldn't tell me yes or no, which is her usual uh, MO. But what she said to me, she said, I just want to tell you one thing. Because the day after the election, I don't want you coming downstairs and reading the paper and having a cup of coffee and saying, geez, I wish I had gone because the Democrat won. He goes, I don't want to hear that for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> that was a smart thing to say. So I ran for election. It was tough. I went through four tires on my car, uh, at least one pair of shoes, and uh, I won. I won the, uh, the election. I got a call from a woman that was helping us out, and she said, I got bad news and good news. I said, well, what's the bad news? She goes, you lost in seven out of eight counties. I go, what's the good news? You, know, you won the election. <laughs> because I won in Monroe County. I was so well known in Monroe County that the votes here uh, stopped the Republican tsunami from the south. <laughs> I called it. Because you know, all the counties down uh, south of us are solid Republicans. So I became a, uh, a Supreme Court judge. Um, they assign you to civil first. So uh, I had been doing criminal for uh, quite some time. And so that was a new thing, but I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the civil uh, practice of being a civil judge. But then the administrative judge came to me and said they needed a, a criminal, somebody to do criminal uh, that had experience. So I became a criminal uh, Supreme Court judge, and um, I was more in my element there. I had a, a quite a few high-profile cases. You might have read some of the. I had that uh, People versus Harlow, which was. Um, a death penalty case. We don't have the death penalty, so it was a class A felony. He killed three people, uh, two people that he had worked for, and then he killed his girlfriend because uh, he thought she was going to the police. I had that Zacker case out of the town of Greece. You may remember that. The guy had no prior record, not a blemish or anything, and he killed his wife, his daughter, and he attempted to kill his other daughter. And that was a very difficult case. I had People versus Hardy, which uh, had, had gone all the way up to the New York State Court of Appeals, uh, where a guy uh, was uh, uh, fleeing a, uh, just a uh, grand larceny, and he uh, killed a, uh, um, uh, he smashed into a car, and the baby, the lady was pregnant, and, and the baby died. And uh, uh, so they charged him with the homicide of the baby, even though the baby was still inside the mother, and, I, and the jury found him guilty. Uh, I charged the jury, and uh, the, uh, they appealed it all the way up, and his, his conviction was upheld. Um, and then I had the Taekwon Rivera case, where the uh, boy that shot the Officer DePanzio, which was also a difficult case. The thing I always remember uh, from that is when he testified. The DA said, you call Officer Anthony DePanzio, and the, whole, the courtroom was it was the biggest courtroom on the fourth floor there. And uh, all of a sudden, you know, you've heard the expression, you could hear a pin drop there. It was just like a quiet. The doors opened in the back, and I could see in the back his dad, who was a court deputy, uh, was holding his arm, and uh, the, the, uh, the victim, the police officer, kind of took his arm away from his dad because he wanted to walk down the uh, place of his own. And that was a dramatic moment. And then when he hit the uh, uh, witness stand, you have to walk up some stairs, and he, and he looked like he was going to have a little difficulty. And my deputy, uh, John Crespo, went to help him, and I looked at him, and I, I nodded him off, let him alone. And so he came up on his own, because I knew he wanted to do that on his own. And then he testified. And that was a dramatic moment in court. 
I think he still has the bullet in his head. I'm not sure because it came from the back, the left side, and, and I saw the pictures. And, and it, uh, you saw the path of the bullet. And that neurologist saved his life. He really did. But uh, that was a difficult case. You often see gruesome things in a homicide cases. I'll tell you one quick story. Uh, we always tell the jurors, if you can't look at pictures, you know, you shouldn't be in the, in the jury. It affects you so that you can't make a judgment here. Uh, they affect you so badly. And most people are honest. So we had this one case, the medical examiner is on the stand, and they have, a, if you've been in that courtroom, the, the big one, they have uh, monitors, big ones on the, th on the, uh, the wall, and uh, there were pictures, and they were quite gruesome, bloody pictures. And uh, while he's testifying, so I'm listening, and all of a sudden I hear, boom. <laughs> I look, and there's 12 jurors and two alternates, so there's 14 seats, and I only see 13 people. <laughs> <laughs> so the guy obviously fainted. The deputies went to help the guy. I excused the jury, and I looked over at the medical examiner, the deputy medical examiner, and I said, uh, "Listen, uh, can you go help out that guy?" And he looked at me with a straight face, and I think he was serious. And he goes. I only work on dead people. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> so that that happens in court once in a while. But um, you know, talking about networking and everything, running for office is difficult, but it, it's oftentimes good for business. I, a lot of lawyers have told me that uh, they meet so many people that it is good for business. Um, getting involved in politics is not so bad uh, if you believe in somebody. It really is. Um, when you're, as a judge, you get involved with uh, local and state justice programs. I got involved in a lot of community associations. The, um, I was a member of the Character and Fitness Committee for the 7th Judicial District. That's the attorneys. In order to become attorneys, they have to pass the bar and then they have to go through this committee. I was the chairman of the jury board of Cayuga County. I was uh, appointed to the New York State Jury Trial Project. Um, I taught at the RIT for 25 years. I taught uh, criminal law. I was an adjunct professor of criminal law, and then I started an accredited uh, internship program. So they got uh, college credit for uh, becoming an intern in the uh, Hall of Justice. When I was in the drug court, I was a presenter uh, at the state and national drug court uh, conferences uh, because I really believed in it, and, uh, and I did a lot uh, for uh, seminars. The, uh, I was appointed the um, uh, supervising judge when I was in the Supreme Court of all criminal cases in the 7th Judicial District. So I was in charge of all criminal cases in the eight counties. What that meant basically is they had to go around, make sure that all the calendars were doing well, that the judges were on trial and, and uh, things like that. Uh, I never had a judge like we had last year, thank God, uh, in the city court. But uh, I had uh, all the judges cooperate very really well. In um, 2012, I was appointed to the appellate division. Uh, New York State, uh, of the appellate division, fourth department is called. I was appointed associate justice. What that means is I now would listen to appeals. Like if I had the Zacker case, and they did appeal that case uh, to the appellate division first. Now I sat on the uh, appellate division in, uh, and listened to appeal. So I, that's how I finished my legal career uh, as an appellate division judge. It was really a fulfilling experience. If you've ever been to the appellate division, there's five judges that sit. Like in Supreme Court, you see nine in the United States. Appellate division, there's five that sit. And we listen to cases and, um, and then decide uh, at uh, the meetings after the cases. Uh, the um, I'm just going to leave you with a couple of thoughts that I think are important for you in life and in business. Um, make sure that your business is not your whole life. <laughs> you know, have your outside activities. You've got to be able to leave stuff. A lot of times people ask me, how can you have a case like that Zacker case where the guy killed his wife and his daughter? And, uh, and I say, you have to leave everything at the, uh, at the Hall of Justice. You can't, you've got to have outside activities. I remember what, during that trial, I came home once, and my wife was sitting at the computer, and she had some pictures of our uh, grandchildren. And one of the pictures, two of the grandchildren were laying on the rug, 
and uh, we just there uh, like diapers on and stuff like that. And I had just seen a picture of two little kids laying on the rug. One of them was dead, and they're almost in the same position. And I picked up the picture and I and I and threw it out. And my wife goes, "What are you doing?" And I said, "I just don't want to. I don't want to talk about it." I said, "I saw this picture today that was really like it." So you gotta leave stuff uh, back in, in, in your business. A couple of uh, uh, things that I always try to do, and you must do it in your own business, is never take away a person's uh, dignity. Uh, you know, don't call people names. A lot of times you read in the paper where a judge uh, really excoriates a defendant, tell them what a bad guy he is, you know, and, and, and they sentence him. You know, what the... I remember one judge one time sentenced somebody to life imprisonment, and the guy mouthed off to the judge. The judge says, I'm going to give you uh, 30 days for contempt. So the guy laughed. The whole courtroom burst out laughing. Right. He just gave him life in prison. He's going to give him 30 days for contempt. You know, you don't, you got to make sure that people have their dignity and, uh, and make sure that people, if they want to be heard, they have the right to be heard. For a judge, public perception is very important. And you've all seen this and noticed. In your own business, public perception is good. One little thing, uh, you know, if you're in the real estate business, you, you might get a bad rap on one little thing, and uh, you know as well as I do. So public perception is very, very important, and always keep that in mind. You're not just working for you, you're working for the public. I have a shave test. In the morning when I shave, if something's not right, if something doesn't seem right to me, uh, then I don't do it. When I get into the office or whatever, then I, I fix it up. I, uh, you know, it's a good time first thing in the morning to try to get to. I had a law clerk, Valerie, who I used to tell her about the shave test. She goes, "What am I supposed to do?" With <laughs> and I said, "Well, when you put your stuff on." <laughs> think about it. Um, when you start arguing with people, look in the book. I mean, you know, a lot of times you argue with people. This person says that about that person. This person says this about your business. Uh, Make sure you've got something to back it up. You just can't argue about stuff because then you lose your credibility. And your credibility as a judge or your credibility in business is so important. There's an old saying that speedy justice is not always justice. And that's the truth. There's no need to rush all the time. You don't have to rush through things. Sometimes take a step back and talk to somebody. Uh, <coughs> it's important a lot of times not to rush through things because you, 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 you only have to do more to fix it at the end. Um, I used to tell young judges, because I used to talk to them about, uh, there's a judge's school that you have to go to uh, when you first elected the judge, and I used to tell them uh, that uh, you have to be always fair and impartial. And when the lawyers, you know, when you get on that bench, everybody says, yes, judge, no judge. Uh, they laugh at your jokes all the time. <laughs> uh, they get you coffee, things like that. It's not you. Mm -hmm. It's the robes and the bench. That's what they respect. And so it's going to take a while for them to respect you. You've got to understand that, that, that they respect the institution. And they'll respect you if you're fair and impartial. And don't get robitis. I always tell them that. That's uh, when you, uh, you know in cases when judges get that. And my most important thing is listen more, talk less. You don't learn anything by talking. And I always finish with the judges saying, and as you get older, never pass a bathroom before you go into the court. <laughs> 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 uh, all right, it's 9 o'clock. <laughs>
push to make that sale. I mean, how do you get past that internal consciousness of, God, this guy for this kid, I have a kid his age, or, you know, from from a lawyer's or judge's standpoint. Yeah, it's funny that you, I was at a doctor's appointment a couple of days ago, and the doctor asked me the same thing. Because oh. uh, he was talking about something. And uh, um, it's a little different when you're in business because you have to, if you're making money to support the family. Sure. Uh, when you're a judge, you're making money the state pays you, so you don't have to. You don't have that obligation. But the thing that you do have is when somebody does come in front of you that you know uh, child abuse cases. There was a terrible cases, and uh, uh, when I was in the civil part with the matrimonial cases, you know, who do you give custody to and things like that, and, and you have those uh, problems. But I, I can honestly tell you that I pushed aside my uh, feelings because my feeling was my family is not involved in this. My kids are not involved. My kids are not going to get involved in this kind of thing. You know, I'm not going to get a divorce. You know, and, uh, I know it's, it's tough. I, I've been married for 47 years to the same woman, so I'm a bit comatose now. <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, um, uh, as far as the abuse, like I never personally felt like I was going to abuse my family or anything like this. So what I did basically is, is say, this is another country. This is not involved with my family at all. And I kept myself straight through there. Um, I did successfully divorce my family from, from my being a judge. I really did. And uh, it's difficult, but you're right. Because you see, you see the bad in people every day when, you go to, when you're on the criminal part. And uh, that's why some people uh, 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 do become prejudiced and they become racist because they, they see this all the time. And, uh, and, and you have to fight it. You have to decide that this is not, you, you, these are not people that are representative of everybody. You know, there's white ones, black ones, purple ones, there's all kinds. And as far as kids, too, there's all kinds of kids and things like that. So you, you just have to divorce yourself. You have to set that aside, but it's difficult when you're making money and, and the money goes to those kids. You know, I know what you're saying. I never had that problem. So. Kind of piggybacking on this one thing, I was on a jury, the, um, both attorneys who were clients graduates and a couple of people on the jury that were clients graduates <laughs> and the judge. Was and you were, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That was a lot. And, oh what yeah. case was that? Oh my gosh. I, mean, I forgot. <laughs> I have to go back and I saw, I remember seeing your name on yeah, yeah. the, uh, one time, uh, I, it, it, we were picking a jury in the, in the front row, there was this woman, and she looked a lot older than me, and she kept smiling, you know, and I was like, what the heck, is she smiling, and I was like, I don't know. So I asked the deputy for the jury list, it was an old girlfriend. <laughs> 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 he said, whoa. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Uh, but, uh, when I, <laughs>
there have been cases, uh, Judge O'Brien had a couple of them reversed because they, they brought uh, Google articles into the jury room. Oh. You know, look at it, we saw we found this guy. Look at it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, great takeaway. Well, I, I'm glad, I'm glad that's good. And in addition to that, it taught me to have, you know, to have a lot. Right. To have good firm policies, to have good structure. Yeah, so I walked away. <laughs> that's good to hear. Some, yeah, you definitely. I bet you had a good experience doing oh, this jury. Yeah. Most people do. It was extremely very surprising. Most people do. Very surprising. Anybody can get called to the jury. Uh, you know, I got called twice, but it didn't get out. Any other questions? Did you learn anything today? Yeah. You still want to be a lawyer? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. What's the best lawyer joke you got? <laughs> Never mind. I'll tell you a judge thing, a true story with a lawyer. Um, I don't know if you know Dave Moranti, anybody know Dave? Um, he's a, an old friend. We tried cases against each other. Uh, when he was a public defender and I was DA, and we had a lot of cases where I was a judge and he was a lawyer. He's a very good lawyer, very good person. Uh, he was in uh, Vietnam. He, when he was in Vietnam, he was in the spotter planes. And so those were the planes that used to come in first to tell the real planes, the bombers, where they were supposed to go. So they used to have a, like an 80% uh, shot down rate. And so he was in dangerous uh, job. Uh, but, he, you know, he's a good all-around guy. He's adopted kids uh, in his life. But in any event, I had a, a difficult defendant, and uh, he, he didn't want to go to trial. So every time he would come up for trial, he'd do something to not go to trial. And, like, one time he punched out his public defender at the jail, so I had to reassign somebody. So finally I said, Dave, you go in and uh, you represent him, you know, because Dave's a big guy, and I said, just take care of him. And he did. He represented. And he told me after the trial, he said, I went in there first and I sat down and I, and I said, listen, uh, you know, I know your reputation. I'm going to take off my glasses. If you want to hit me, do it now while I got my glasses off. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first thing he said to the guy. And the, and the guy said, I don't know why everybody thinks I'm so violent. You know? <laughs> anyway, um, so now comes the thing for the trial. So it's a Friday, the Friday before the Monday where we have the trial. Uh, we make sure everything is ready, we go through everything, uh, and so we're ready to go. And so the guy goes, I don't want to go to trial, man. I said, well, you're going. We're ready to go now. So he starts going out, and he goes, you're an effing a-hole. No. Says the whole thing. So I said, bring him back. So he brought that back. I said, I know that you want me to hold you in contempt, because if I hold you in contempt, I have to recuse myself, and you won't go to trial on Monday. But I'm not going to hold you in contempt. We're going to trial on Monday. I'll see you Monday. <laughs> <laughs> so he comes back Monday. Dave's sheepish, you know. So they, he said, Judge, can we approach the bench? So they go, like, uh, now what? So the DA comes up and says, What's going on? He goes, My client wants a bench trial. I said, What? He goes, Yeah, he doesn't want a jury. He wants a bench trial with you. I said, Well, that's okay with me, but you better remind him that. That uh, he'll be in front of the F and A. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll leave you with that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Thank you.